Hi again then guys and welcome to the very first car review of course from the 1.36 patch and what better place to start these reviews than with arguably the most significant pair of vehicles from the whole update. And the reason why I say pair is because as you will have seen from the title I'm reviewing both versions, both the Honda and the Toyota or TRD engine versions of the Dallara SF19 Super Formula car in the same video. And the reason why I'm doing so is very simple. It's the same reason why you could technically review most of the NASCARs in one video in, for instance, Gran Turismo 6. At least the ones that come from the same years, because in certain disciplines of racing, such as NASCAR, uh, Super Formula, Formula 1, although there are very, very small variations that are allowed, there are virtually none. They're pretty much non-existent. The cars have to be so similar that they may as well be exact copies, just with a different sticker. Sometimes they pretty much are exact copies, especially when you have the same engine sourcing. On this occasion, the cars have exactly the same specs across the board. Same year, of course. Same look, same power, same torque, same weight, same horsepower per ton, same class, and same price. The cockpit view is the same. The only thing that's different is the name and the stickers. Apart from that, it literally does not matter which one you buy. So with that in mind, what are these cars like? Maybe if you haven't bought one yet. Well, don't fear if you haven't, they're not overly expensive. One million credits apiece, technically speaking, you only need to buy one of them, just whichever one you would rather represent. Most people seem to prefer Honda, I don't particularly care myself, the cars are the same. But in terms of performance, these are amazing. A lot of people have been very happy with these, as I touched on in my overarching breakdown and the first look at the patch a couple of days ago, this is easily the standout pair of cars for me. It's my favourite car of the update easily because it's so good. They have outstanding handling, you can do a lot of different uh, tuning styles or setup styles to the car and it'll still feel and handle fantastic because the essential vehicle underneath all of that tuning is just a great car. And I know, revolutionary to say that a formula car is good around a track, who'd have ever guessed, right? But it doesn't really go without saying. Something like that could be taken for granted, but the difference between formula cars, not just of different years, but of different subcategories, like F2000, Formula Ford, Formula One, Super Formula, like here, Formula Nippon, they are different, very different to each other. So for me, for instance, I love this car, but I'm not a huge fan of the Mercedes F1 car or of the Lotus 970T ripoff, of course the F1500 TA. I don't particularly like those two cars or use them that much. I've already done more driving time in these two Super Formula cars than I have in pretty much all of the other Formula cars in the game. So that speaks volumes. Now in terms of the specs, they're pretty small in terms of capacity, 2 litre engines, both of them, 639 horsepower, which is very impressive, 368 pound-feet of torque, which is pretty decent for a relatively small capacity engine, the weight is 660 kilos, which everyone of course jumped on the bandwagon of when I mentioned that it was lighter or heavier even than a Formula 1 car, saying, oh actually current Formula 1 cars weigh more than that, they're actually about 720 kilos. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I didn't say modern F1, I said F1. And when I said F1, I was thinking more stuff like the Formula Gran Turismo, which is categorically not even close, and neither is the F1500 TA. Those were the true Formula 1 cars as far as my mind goes. These days, 720 kilos, which let's remember is due to ballast more than anything else, that's not what I would refer to as a Formula 1 car's weight. It's technically the weight of a formula car, but the vast majority of time, over the previous decades even, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, even some of the 70s, around 550 kilos has been the weight of a formula car. Formula One in particular, so that was what I was referring to. From that point of view, which is what I meant, these cars are significantly heavier. Current F1, of course, these are lighter by about 60 ish kilos, about 70 kilos. So there's a difference, but not a ridiculous one. It's not like the difference between like a 
a GT1 car and a Group C car. There's a massive void between those two, even though they competed in a very similar series, albeit multiple years later under a revised rulebook. Now in terms of what these cars can do, for instance in a straight line, not just for handling, you're looking at a top speed of around 180 with high downforce and relatively close gearing. Stock gearing, for instance, with the highest downforce will give you, as I said, about 180 or so. And the acceleration, of course, is so rabidly quick that you get to that top speed very quickly. But the funny thing about that is that any car that accelerates really quickly feels like the top speed isn't as good. It's kind of a funny little paradox that happens when you're driving a car that has ridiculous acceleration, where unless the top speed is insanely high, like a Tomahawk or a Red Bull, it somehow feels slow. Like, if this car rockets up to 180, you feel like, oh, I'm only doing 180. But it's weird. It's very strange how that happens, because in a sports car, 180 feels great. But in a car that gets to 180 so quickly, it feels like you're kind of hitting the rev limiter. Whereas that's not technically the case. 180 is more than fast enough to put down incredible laps on most tracks. Now, speaking of those lap times, I touched on the fact earlier on today in my review for both of these cars, or not my review, the, the circuit setup, I should say, that the lap times are very strong immediately. My best lap in this run, which you can see part of in the video in the BMW liveried version, which is the Honda, that vehicle did a 128.1 around Autopolis, the longer of the two circuit layouts. I'm sure there are plenty of people who could go quicker than that, but for me that was my fastest lap I've done on that track so far. Not too surprising given that the real world record on that track I believe is with one of these cars. Then on Dragon Trail as well, which you could see in the tune earlier today and also in this video, I did a 121 2 which is also the fastest lap I've ever done on Dragon Trail. Now, I do need to clarify, there are certain vehicles which I've never taken on Dragon Trail. I've never driven the Red Bull on that track, for instance, so I have no doubt that that would be quicker, but it's such an overwhelmingly fast car, but in a way that is far more relevant than a Red Bull. Because something like a Tomahawk or a Red Bull, it means nothing, because it's not a real-world car. They exist as empty shells, but they don't do that kind of actual performance, whereas this is real. Which makes it all the more impressive just how fast it is. Especially when you factor in that you've got no way near the power of something like a Tomahawk, less power than a Red Bull. It's a staggeringly impressive achievement to really what aerodynamics, almost alone, have done or have advanced in in the past years and decades in all forms of Formula Racing, not just Formula 1. Because it's easy to just focus in on Formula 1, it's the pinnacle of Formula Racing, and for obvious reasons that is what people tend to look at the most. But don't sleep on these other categories like Nippon or Super Formula or F2000 because these other kinds of class are still fiercely competitive. It's like saying that GT1 is more competitive than, say, GT500. Technically, it's probably more famous, generally speaking, in the motorsport world, but in, say, 2006, 2007, and I'm sure to some degree even to this day, the lap times in qualifying in something like a Super GT event were all within a second of each other. The entire grid. So, don't always try to look at the top tier of motorsport for the most excitement. It doesn't work that way. Open your mind to lower classes and you'll be surprised just how competitive it can still be. And this is a perfect example of that because it's a car with less power than most prototypes, it's heavier than most older F1 cars, and it's still fast enough to wipe the floor with most of the other cars in the game. It's just that good. Now technically, this is actually one of the newest race cars in Gran Turismo from 2019, so it's not too surprising that the technology behind it would make it that good through corners. And there are certain tracks where you don't even need to slow down at all. Even on Dragon Trail, you can take that triple S bend full throttle, and it does it no problem. It feels like it's not even a corner at all. Very, very impressive stuff. And incidentally, just to briefly speak on, again, the subject of power and weight, the power is not as ridiculously high as a Formula One car, and the weight, of course, is above some and below some, as we discussed, but the horsepower per ton is still incredibly high. It's not quite a thousand horsepower per ton, but it's 968. That's huge. 
Now of course you'd expect something like a Formula car to have a very impressive power to weight ratio, but it really does, especially given that the power is far lower than most Formula cars that we would typically see in Gran Turismo. I don't recall the exact power of the Mercedes, but I recall that the Formula Gran Turismo, for instance, from the last couple of games, that had, what, 880 horsepower, something like that? So this is no way near those kind of levels. And the Lotus as well, the 97T, could be oil changed to over a thousand horsepower, and yet I would put my money on this car over that one on technical circuits because it's that kind of gearbox technology, suspension, in particular aerodynamics and downforce that advances so quickly in the Formula world and also in the prototype world more than all others that makes these cars so dominant. And from year to year they just keep getting faster and faster and to think that all of that comes from the engineering of airflow, it's very cool. It's something which is easy to underestimate if you're not from an automotive background but the more you know about cars the more you are impressed by stuff like that just controlling the flow of wind being such a tool such a weapon to be used in the arsenal of motorsport it's very very clever stuff and very cool and when you see it done well it's a sight to behold and you can experience that kind of technology in these two cars now group x of course is what we've come to expect from something like this it's unfortunate i wish they hadn't done that of course I kind of wish that there were subcategories or their own categories for Formula cars, but that's the way it is for the moment, and of course these cars would be way too good for any other category. Even if you put it in Group 1, they would beat most Group 1 cars and Vision GTs handily on something like the Nürburgring or any kind of really tight technical circuit where top speed doesn't matter. So overall, if you haven't bought one yet, what are you doing? Of course you should. Group X it almost doesn't matter in a car like this. In a similar way to the Red Bull and the Tomahawk and a couple of others, don't be put off by the Group X. Is it unfortunate? To some degree, yes. But that doesn't mean that the car isn't worth buying. It's an outstanding piece of performance engineering. It puts a smile on your face immediately. My only qualm about these two cars is the same one that I mentioned in my first look at the update, and that is the Halo. In cockpit view, it's very annoying. And I had some comments saying, oh, if you use VR, it cancels out the problem. Obviously, in the real world, with the way humans' eyes work, you can see past it, kind of like focusing on your finger in front of your face. That's all well and good. I don't dispute any of that, but I shouldn't need to use VR to experience a car. VR should be an addition to a game, not a necessity. So that is my only qualm, because the fact is, it does get in the way, and it is annoying. If you look on a track where the road is straight for a long time, the centerpiece of the halo literally covers the entire road ahead. So it's pretty annoying, but if that's the only downside you have, and the simple fix is to use a different camera angle, like I do most of the time anyway, that's not bad. If that's the best, worst thing you've got to say about a car, then I'd say that's a pretty good vehicle. So overall, get out there, do some lobbies with this thing, get some one-make racing going, it will be extremely competitive and it's easily my favourite Formula car of the entire Gran Turismo series. I would definitely go so far as to say that. It's not the fastest, but it is my favourite because it's so fun and it gives you so much feedback through corners as well. But that's it overall for this review. Of course, if you haven't checked out my Circuit Tune, also available for both of these versions, the Toyota and the Honda, give it a look. As I said, it's a pretty self-explanatory car. It's already good, so there's not that much that you need to do to it. But give the tune a go, see what you think. It's a very forgiving car. And that's it for my thoughts on this one. So, of course, stick around on the channel as I break down all of the other vehicles from the pack. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.